Uh, today's session is on facilitating goods <clears throat> movement uh, through operations. My name is Donald Ludlow of CPCS, and we're going to talk a bit today about the role of trucking and about the role of, of your agencies in assisting trucks uh, moving on the highways of North America. Uh, to do that, really, there are four key questions that the presentation is designed to answer today. The first is, what are freight operations? Second, how can your agency help facilitate goods movement? Third, what are the emerging technologies and applications that assist in this endeavor? And fourth, how can you engage the private sector, meaning the shippers, the truckers, the brokers, uh, to be your partners in this, uh, in this quest? So, First, what are freight operations? And I'm going to skip right here to this slide. Uh, you'll see a very busy highway in Southern California. This is I-405. And you might be asking, um, well, there really aren't that many trucks. This is pretty common. Most urban freeways in the United States have somewhere between 3 to 6 percent uh, uh, truck traffic. Some are as high as 12 percent. For those of you who know I-35 in Austin, Texas, that's about 12%. That's a really high percentage. Um, so trucks comprise a relatively small percentage of the VMT and the AADT on any given highway, but we have to recognize that, um, that trucks are carrying a lot of value uh, for the US economy. Uh, trucks are roughly carrying about $50 billion a day in value in the United States, even though they comprise less than 10% of the VMT. So we're going to talk today a bit about um, economic competitiveness and, and really the keys uh, to ensuring that this high value um, movement continues to take place smoothly and efficiently in the United States. This slide shows um, a typology of freight operations. And one thing we have to keep in mind, I know we're probably pretty focused here on trucks and trucking because we're highway people, but almost every freight move uh, in the United States at least part of that move um, touches another mode. Very often, uh, something's coming from Asia or from Europe on a ship. Uh, it's moved to truck or rail at one of our major gateways. By the time it reaches your home or your place of business, it's back on a truck again. Um, the, the theme through all of, of, of the freight story in the United States is that even though uh, our freight is often multimodal, trucking is always there. Trucking is, uh, is ubiquitous in this, in this movement, and we have to be, as, as transportation professionals, helping uh, that movement um, uh, be smooth in getting to where it needs to be. Um, one of the interesting things, re interesting recent trends is that um, uh, the trucking companies have become the top customer of America's railroads. Uh, you think that's, that's kind of strange. It used to be coal, but now it's trucking, and, and intermodal specifically. And that's because um, in many circumstances for those long haul moves, the trucking companies need or want to use rail. It's more cost effective for them and in some cases a little bit faster uh, to get a load across the country. But regardless of where it starts and stops, it will end up on the highway in your, uh, in your agency's jurisdiction um, on its way to, uh, to where it needs to be. Um, to really understand uh, goods movement in the United States, I think we have to think about the decision making that goes into how something moves on the highways. There are various decision makers. Um, there are shippers, like Amazon. There are brokers, like large third-party logistics companies who um, a shipper might hire uh, to actually design the routing and to design their supply chain. There's the consignee, which is um, often um, my home at the end of an Amazon purchase. And then there's the trucker, or the other conductor, if it's a different mode, moving, that, um, moving those goods to where they need to be. Um, during those uh, moves, there are a number of diff different decisions that need to be made. One of them is the pickup location, another is the drop-off. Uh, which mode will it take? Which gateway will it use? Uh, the routes and corridors, and even the schedule. Uh, the point I'm trying to make here is that very few of these decisions are made by the trucker. And the trucker is the person who we're interfacing with as a transportation agency, typically. They're the ones using the highway. But there's a whole line of decision making that's behind their movement that's dictating where, they are, where they're at. This is becoming increasingly the case as the size and scale of freight operations grows and the complexity of supply chains uh, grow as well. 
Um, in many circumstances, the trucker is only responsible for the routing decision, some of the routing decision, and maybe where to park, which is part of the reason why we're going to spend a bit of time today talking about truck parking, which has become a really important freight operations issue. Ultimately, what governs these decisions is the total cost of logistics, and that has to do with regulatory compliance and the movement of the, of the goods uh, from point A to point B. If you, if you think about a finished product that you get at your house, let's say you're buying uh, maybe a television and it's being shipped to your house um, via a Walmart or another e-tailer, um, for every dollar of finished product, um, it's costing about four to six cents or about four to six percent in transportation. So that's really the margin that we're affecting uh, when we are talking about freight operations is that four to six percent margin. And with a major bottleneck or another issue, uh, those margins can really start to slide. Some of the other issues that uh, trucking communities facing recently include um, compliance, including hours of service. And obviously, all of this is facilitated by, by having the right information. So why do we care about freight? Um, we've talked a little bit about freight being part of that factor, part of that 4 to 6% of the cost of a finished good. Um, freight really does move the economy in the United States and sustains the major industries in your state. If you think about your jurisdiction and where some of the most important um, industrial activity is taking place and where some of the most important jobs are um, in terms of their ability to create a family wage, often uh, those are very reliant upon freight. And so this is why it's, it's really important for us. Um, part of the, the, the calculation here is that freight VMT is growing a lot faster than passenger VMT, and it has been for quite some time. Uh, since 1970, um, freight VMT has roughly doubled. It used to be about 3% of VMT, and now it's between 7 and 8%. Federal Highway Administration just this summer released some new studies with long-term VMT forecasts, and they're calling for an even greater disparity between the growth in passenger and freight volumes. They're essentially estimating a compound annual growth rate of 0.92% VMT for uh, automobiles and about 2.15% VMT growth um, year over year for trucks. So we're gonna continue to have a situation in the future where trucking is gonna consume more of our highway assets, more of our space, and be a much uh, greater emphasis in our operations. So now that we've kind of discussed why freight is important, um, let's talk about a little bit more of, about what agencies can do to improve freight operations. And this will really be the focus of, of the remainder of the uh, presentation today. So there's a number of different things, and many of you here are probably engaged in these types of activities. Um, they include identifying and mitigating operations issues like recurring bottlenecks, uh, improving fluidity, um, reducing safety uh, problems. Um, another big part of what you do is disseminating and integrating information on road conditions, on truck parking, on routing, and then collaborating with the private sector. So those are the things that we're going to talk about for the remainder of the session. Let's first talk about what agencies can do to improve freight bottlenecks. Uh, one of the first things that uh, you can do is identify where those recurring bottlenecks are taking place. There's a lot of new data available to do this uh, that's making uh, these types of exercises a lot more scientific. Um, uh, one of the main things that we need to do is determine the causes of the bottleneck and then prescribe and implement solutions. Uh, the table on the screen shows a typology of bottlenecks, uh, including the constraint type um, we have to also take into consideration the roadway type and the type of freight route. Federal Highway and the I-95 Corridor Coalition, among others, have put a lot of effort into researching freight bottlenecks and their solutions, so there's a lot of available literature. Recently, states, including Washington State DOT, and we're seeing a map uh, from Washington State DOT on this map, have been doing a lot of research on severe truck bottlenecks. This particular map shows a section of I-5 north of downtown Seattle where there's very severe congestion. They've created several grades here. We have unreliable at a.m., midday, and p.m., and then at night, reliably fast. They have these grades for several of the major corridors in Washington State, and they've accomplished this by using GPS data. There's a lot of information out there for agencies um, to use 
uh, to do this type of work, um, including uh, the freight performance, manage, freight performance measures system, the FPM from Federal Highway, which takes a close look at major freight corridors on a national basis. If you're drilling down into local data in your community, the National Performance Measurement Research data set, the NPM RDS, is becoming a much more useful tool for doing this kind of work. It combines data from here and ATRI. ATRI is the American Transportation Research Institute, and they bring in uh, truck fleet data, a very rich source, and you're able to identify speed differentials um, to look at those bottlenecks. The second step in uh, understanding the freight bottlenecks is not just understanding where the trucks are moving slowly or being slowed down, but understanding the industries that are affected. And that's where um, often working with your freight planning staff in your agency uh, is, is useful. Uh, they have information on this as well as the economic development people in terms of the major routes that the trucks are using and which industries are using them. If you had a particular industry in your state that you knew, knew you wanted to help make more economically competitive, this would be one way to do that, uh, looking at the truck bottlenecks affecting that particular sector, and then working with that industry, your governor's office and others, uh, to really take a close look at the types of things uh, that are affecting that competitiveness. And obviously there's no replacement for field research, for spending time in the field, um, understanding where the trucks are moving, observing them, and then working with the private sector. Um, a lot of states are integrating freight operations into their planning work. Um, one of the states that I'm currently working with is Arizona. I'm working on a statewide freight plan there. We've been using ATRI data, GPS data, to identify truck bottlenecks. We've basically been comparing free flow speed um, to peak delay and identifying the types of bottlenecks. This table shows several types of bottlenecks and when those bottlenecks are most severe. Um, for example, here's a bottleneck um, near um, Tucson that persists both AM and PM in both directions and is really congested related. But other bottlenecks are related to steep, cur uh, steep grades, <coughs> curves, um, truck and local activities. So developing a typology that's easier for policymakers to understand, I think is something that we can powerfully do uh, with the data that we have available. There's really four schools of thought in terms of mitigating actions for truck bottlenecks. One of them is uh, to correct capacity deficiencies. This requires us to build, to expand uh, the highway system in order to accommodate uh, the demands that are on it. Another is shifting or reducing <coughs> facility demand. This often includes um, travel demand management approaches or working um, with railroads to look at investments on multimodal corridors. Um, I-81 in Virginia has long been uh, the focus of, of studies that have been trying to look at ways that some of the truck traffic, which is very heavy on that corridor, could be potentially diverted to rail. Um, there are others like that. Um, another one that we're gonna spend some time on today is uh, implementing aggressive incident management, really clearing those truck accidents quickly. But ultimately, uh, it's the portfolio approach, or really taking into account all of these pieces and customizing it is, is the way that things um, have, have been best achieved in most locations that have been successful in doing this. Another area that uh, planners and operations folks have been looking at in more detail recently is, is freight fluidity. It's a term that Federal Highway and TRB have been using, and it, it basically means um, that, you're that you're providing a certain level of reliability uh, that the freight community can bank on. They can make their plans accordingly. Um, for them, reliability and predictability are more important than anything else. Um, in fact, it may be more important to simply have a good algorithm uh, that a logistics group is using to be able to establish parameters um, for, uh, for a supply chain uh, based on predictability than, uh, than saving a lot of time. In other words, they, they want to know how to plan effectively. Uh, one of the things that we can do as, as uh, transportation agencies is take a close look at where our freight clusters are located. Um, you're probably familiar with these in your own community, uh, large distribution centers, manufacturing centers, and then looking at the ways in which the trucks are moving from those centers to your interstates and other major arterials. Often there will be things that could be done there, including uh, traffic light synchronization or geometrics uh, to make those things move much more smoothly. 
I'll cite one example here not far from us is uh, the major East Coast distribution center for the Nordstrom stores. This would include the main stores and the Nordstrom rack stores. It's in Collingtown, Maryland, just off of the Capitol Beltway. You'll see on the map that the access to this location is uh, sometimes constrained. This is a crude snapshot using Google typical traffic um, that shows some of the slowdowns accessing this area. Uh, this particular distribution center is among many major uh, retailers who have their distribution centers in this area. And the important point here is that the local access to this center not only affects movements um, in the direct vicinity of the distribution center, but the entire East Coast. You'll see on the map there's a distribution shed, uh, as we say in the business, of this entire region stretching from Maine down to North Carolina that all rely on this single distribution center. So if there's traffic here, it's affecting uh, the cost of goods and the productivity all along the East Coast. So there you have a little animation showing the rack stores and the main stores and the distribution centers. Um, out in the rest of the country, here are the locations of the major Nordstrom distribution centers and the approximate freight sheds that rely on the local access provided to those. So in other words, if the local distribution center um, in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa is uh, constrained. It's affecting flows all the way down to Texas. So another thing that I wanted to talk about today was incident management and aggressive quick clearance. This is something that we've seen a number of DOTs institute. Um, two of the more notable and um, historic programs have been uh, the Georgia TRIP program, which is the Towing and Recovery Incident Program, and the Florida Risk Rapid Incident Scene Clearance. In these programs, the state DOT has reserved or has created a contractor pool of capable uh, companies who have the correct equipment, including heavy duty wreckers, air cushion systems, and other mechanisms to quickly right side overturn trucks and, and otherwise resolve truck accidents. Um, in Florida, the program started in 2004 and has been highly successful. Some of the parameters that they place on their contractors include 60 minutes to arrival time uh, with related equipment and about 90 minutes to clear the travel lanes. If they do this, the travel, uh, excuse me, if they do this, the contractor is eligible for a bonus, a $2,500 bonus. If they don't do this after 180 minutes, they're actually, um, they may be assessed liquidated damages. So there's a, a really very clear financial incentive um, that's tied to this and can be very uh, critical in clearing accidents. One of the areas where agencies probably need to do a little bit better is, in, is with respect to handling uh, oversized overweight loads. Uh, when these types of heavy pieces of equipment uh, have an accident, you can have a really very long and protracted uh, bottleneck or traffic jam. This particular picture shows a generator that was on its way from Iowa to Springfield, Oregon uh, when it overturned on an off-ramp. This happened about 5.20 a.m., but it took um, crews until 8.45 p.m., or about 15 hours, to clear the ramp. They just simply didn't have those things in place. And more and more states are looking at retaining contractors who have the capability to move the heavy loads out of the way if something like this happens and, and really uh, uh, help resolve these types of issues. I don't mean to pick on Oregon. Um, Oregon is not a hotbed of truck uh, problems, but uh, there is another very good example in Oregon where they've taken a look at safety hotspots. Uh, one particular place is on I-84 in the Wallowa Mountains between uh, Boise and Pendleton. It's called Cabbage Hill. There's a 6% grade, a 2,000 foot elevation change in just 19 miles, and it had been a, a high, a, a, the scene of, of high number of truck accidents, especially from 2003 to 2007, most of which were out of state carriers. So the state instituted a, a number of different programs, including a public information campaign targeted at the truckers to allow them to know that this was a problem location, that they needed to be aware of it, that they needed to take it very seriously. Uh, the other information is they used upstream WIM uh, to relate the uh, weights to a transponder in the truck to advise them. They even would cite the name, in this case, uh, the Tate Company, uh, that they needed to slow down. It was a clear attention getter. Uh, this ultimately result resulted in about a 13% reduction in, in crashes, um, which, which is a significant change and something worthy of consideration in other places in the United States. Another thing that uh, DOTs are doing is, is really trying to reach out to the trucking community to keep them informed of the types of 
um, things that are happening on the highway. Uh, Washington State DOT does an excellent job of this. They have a, uh, a text messaging and email system that's specifically targeted to the trucking and freight community. Um, I've been receiving this for years, and um, I have placed a very noted, um, a very common message on the screen, and that is that there's a problem on Snoqualmie Pass. For those of you who have, have driven or lived in Washington State, um, I-90 through Snoqualmie Pass is frequently subject to rock slides, avalanches, and other problems. And this gets the message out to the trucking community very quickly and in a targeted way so they know how to respond. Washington State also has real-time travel restrictions uh, based on their website so that as trucking uh, companies are looking at whether they can move through certain parts of the state, they can quickly determine roads and bridges that are out and adjust accordingly. Um, I mentioned earlier I wanted to talk about truck parking. It's one of the things that the drivers control, and it's, a, it's one of the areas that a state DOT can, can have an influence. Um, there is a severe shortage of safe legal parking options in the United States, and nearly half hour, uh, truckers spend nearly a half hour each day searching uh, for uh, trucking, a, a safe place to park their trucks. In the United States, we have over 2.2 million uh, registered long-haul trucks, and USDOT just finished its JSON study uh, survey, survey of truck parking and determined that there are approximately 300,000 trucking spots in the United States, most of which about 90% are at private truck stops. So you think, think about that, that's a pretty big mismatch between 2.2 million registered long haul trucks and 300,000 spaces. And given the hours of service requirements, uh, there's, there's really a severe shortage. Um, the Jason's Law study concluded that there were five corridors that had the most severe shortages in the United States. I-95, I-40, I-80, I-81, and I-10. I don't think that this is going to change. Uh, we talked a little bit earlier about the increase in truck VMT relative to passenger VMT as the number of trucks and the demands uh, for freight for consumers continue to grow. I think we're going to have an even more protracted uh, truck and severe truck shortage, truck parking shortage in the United States. So what are DOTs doing about this? Uh, there are a number of state initiatives and private initiatives to take a close look. Um, in Utah, um, the state DOT has developed a truck parking inventory study where they've taken a really close look at their truck parking, especially on I-15 and I-80. Salt Lake City is a major crossroads uh, for uh, truck activity in the United States, especially refrigerated trucking. Often the truck drivers who were surveyed would say that if they didn't get to Salt Lake City between, uh, you know, between 3 and 4 p.m., they were probably out of luck in terms of finding a safe trucking spot. Some of the team drivers, which means more than one drivers were in a, were in a truck, would roll straight through. They just tried to avoid the area. They would just refuel to get through there. And that doesn't always lead to safe operations as those trucks get to other parts of the country. UDOT has a set of maps um, that are available to show truckers where the parking is available. Some states are taking it a little bit further. Um, Minnesota and others have, have looked at truck parking availability and um, specifically uh, have been designing some pilot programs to look at uh, ways of identifying and, and helping trucks know where the, tr where the spaces are, are available in real time. Um, we're going to take a look at a quick video here. It's about a two-minute video by Minnesota DOT that summarizes this study, and I hope you find it uh, interesting and provoking uh, in terms of things your state DOT could be looking at. Hi, my name is John Tompkins. I'm project manager for the Truck Parking Availability Study, a proof of concept study with the University of Minnesota. The study is to look at truck parking availability along the I-94 corridor. This corridor is very significant for trucks coming to and through the Twin Cities area. We are using video technology that has been developed to be able to see space availability along this corridor. The video technology scans to look for available spaces and then relays the information one of three ways. One, through electronic signs along the highway. Second, through an onboard demand system in the trucker's cab. And thirdly, through the World Wide Web. Elm Creek location was the first rest area that was tested. They tested in several conditions. One, in the snow, 
one why it was snowing and another just in nighttime conditions and in all cases it was at 95 percent accuracy on availability of spaces at that particular location our goal is to provide better information for truck driver safety along freight corridors and to assist in the impact of hours of service regulations this system will give information to the truck driver to better assess his or her trip through the Twin Cities area. By helping find suitable parking spaces, we can combat the problems of driver fatigue on our highways. The study will be completed in December of this year, 2014. Uh, we're looking to have all the results done by no later than spring of 2015. This project is funded by FHWA and MnDOT in partnership with the University of Minnesota, with assistance from the American Transportation Research Institute and PeopleNet. Okay, great. Um, so Minnesota is kind of on the cutting edge of looking at this and um, has just recently released some of the findings of this and have found it to be very positive. I, I believe other states are taking a close look at this. On the uh, private sector side, there are a number of partnerships that are occurring right now between um, developers of apps, uh, smartphone apps and truck rest stops. One of them is uh, TSPS, uh, which is a common app. Um, this basically uses uh, loop detectors and other sensors in parking areas to be able to provide truckers with a very real-time view of where they have availability as they're approaching. Trying to help them save that half hour a day they spend looking for truck parking. In Europe, uh, there's crowdsourced information. Um, truck Parking Europe is uh, responsible for providing information on about 18,000 trucking spaces. Um, they have a caveat on the app. Uh, essentially, please note that the app only provides a platform for data, which is essentially generated by users of the app. Owners of truck parking can, be uh, can join a verified program that blocks uh, the community from editing information about the spots. So this is another emerging technology that's kind of coming from the grassroots uh, side, in addition to complement the efforts of, uh, of states. Um, in the United States, there's an app called Trucker Path, which has kind of taken flight. A number of truckers are using this. Uh, well, really, quite a few, almost 200,000. And it's, it's crowdsourced as well, but also has some ability to help um, trucks with route planning and uh, identifying places to stay at truck stops as well. Um, in Maryland, where we're at right now, the state has developed an app um, that allows for emergency truck parking. Um, when there are more than six inches of snow, uh, they open up a number of the rest areas for truck parking across the state, and this app provides uh, truckers with those locations and helps them facilitate that. So there's a lot of different approaches that both uh, the public sector and the private sector are taking to truck parking. A lot of it has to do with identifying uh, open spaces in real time and using the assets that we have at both rest areas and at truck stops to more efficiently um, uh, place folks. Often this requires multi-state coordination. Um, there's the I-80 uh, uh, op Winter Operations uh, Coalition. Another similar group is the Northwest Passage um, that works on these types of issues. And essentially they're, they're using these weather events as a means of, of coordinating uh, truck parking and other issues uh, related to winter closures. Uh, they're sharing information, they're coordinating closures, and in some uh, places, including uh, Nevada and California, they're finding places for trucks to park in communities. Uh, for example, uh, around the Reno area, uh, if there's a closure over the Sierra Nevadas, that's coordinated. And um, there's some information that's being developed to help trucks uh, understand where to park uh, before they try to attempt uh, those mountain passes. Um, I know you're going to be talking more today about connected vehicles, um, but I did want to mention a few key aspects of connected trucks. This is a really important uh, issue in the freight industry and for the trucking community in particular. USDOT has used several trucks, three integrated trucks with wireless crash warning devices in some of the Ann Arbor testing that was recently uh, conducted. And as of February 2014, there was a ruling by NHTSA that all trucks and cars will have to have V2V technologies. One of the more interesting uh, deployments that we're looking at right now is uh, in the first wave of the, C of the, um, 
of the connected vehicle pilots. Wyoming was awarded a pilot study to really look at I-80. Um, for those of you who have driven I-80 in the winter, or frankly even the spring, and sometimes even the fall, uh, you can understand that it's, it's, a, it's an interesting uh, corridor that's subject to a lot of uh, weather incidents, uh, not to mention periodically some range fires. Um, but snow and blowing snow are really the main problem. The, the map on the screen shows kind of the propensity for blowing snow in the United States, and you can see that the I-80 corridor in Wyoming is right in the middle of that. Um, this is a very heavy freight corridor. This corridor carries 30 to 70 percent truck volumes, depending on the season, and is really one of the major conduits between the West Coast and the Midwest. Um, so during, uh, during a recent period, 2002 to 2014, there were nearly 3,500 vehicle crashes related to high winds, many of which were commercial vehicle crashes. So the idea be be behind this pilot is to test V2 um, vehicle to infrastructure and vehicle to vehicle connectivity with snow plows, uh, trucks uh, at fleet management centers and with roadside equipment. Uh, to see what kind of improvement can be made in slowing trucks down. One of the major problems is if there's a platoon of trucks that's not very far apart and they're approaching one of these uh, blizzard condition areas, they simply can't see far enough ahead to know. So we're, we're hoping, and, and those who are conducting the study are hoping that this really helps um, give those trucks advanced warning of those abrupt slowdowns to prevent uh, the number of crashes and incidents that they're experiencing there. So it's very promising and I think will have applications for other parts of the country. Uh, a similar, well, not totally similar study in uh, Nevada, uh, the state has allowed Freightliner uh, to come in and test a new truck called Inspiration um, on its state highway and interstates. Uh, this is an auton a largely autonomous truck that has um, something called highway pilot, which is a lot like autopilot in an airplane. Uh, the video that they have shows the truck driver um, uh, basically Skyping his kids on an iPad while the truck drives itself down the freeway. It's a little bit misleading because uh, at, at this point they're still requiring a, a second driver in the truck. Um, but essentially, um, the trucking community is very interested in this because it would allow trucks to platoon. Um, it would allow, if, if there are multi-state corridors that would allow this type of thing, then we're talking about very significant uh, cost savings in terms of drivers and um, the movement of freight. So there's a lot of interest in this. Um, we should closely monitor what's happening in uh, Nevada uh, in the future as they test, uh, test the, the, uh, the autonomous trucks. Federal Highway Administration has been involved in a number of different um, uh, deployment, technology deployment areas to improve uh, freight uh, movement. One of them is the Freitas system, which is the Freight Advanced Traveler Information System. It consists of several different modules, including a real-time uh, information sensor within the truck. It provides dynamic route guidance and um, also optimizes drayage. It does some load matching. This has been used in some gateway and major freight regions, and it's currently being piloted in the Los Angeles region. Uh, there, they're focusing on minimizing the queues at the major ports. Uh, Dallas-Fort Worth is trying to look at optimizing drayage, and South Florida has uh, similar uh, goals, but also wants to be able to look at this for um, coordinating emergency operations due to their um, uh, potential uh, uh, incident of a hurricane in that region. Uh, Freitas is, is written in open source code so that the idea, the idea is that in the future this would end up being a base for private sector applications and other technologies to kind of spring forth. Uh, the next big thing in freight operations and probably in your world as well is this concept of big data. Um, frankly, when we look at the private sector, they're just getting started, which is a little surprising, but I think the public sector is even further behind the curve. <laughs> Recent interview showed that about 8% of shippers and 5% of uh, brokers or logistics providers have implemented big data in their supply chains. I think there's major potential for public sector agencies uh, to do this. Um, TRB currently has an initiative to look at big data and freight. And uh, some of the findings so far are that uh, some of the ports throughout the world, including the port of Hamburg, which are heavily instrumented, have been able to glean and, and, and kind of uh, make some major changes in efficiency uh, due to the implementation of, of big data. Um, for state DOTs, this would uh, really require working with the private trucking community to see what types of data were available 
and the applications. Um, I think the point here is that we're get, just getting started. Uh, quoting uh, one of the, the, the experts in this area, Peter Kavetsu from Teradata, um, he says the major benefits from data come from answering unanticipated questions. Often with big data, um, uh, you find things that you, you hadn't necessarily anticipated and can work with those trends to improve uh, operations. The last point I wanted to touch on today was uh, really working with freight stakeholders to make a difference in uh, freight operations. Uh, within your states, uh, whether you know this or not, there are already freight advisory groups. Um, your planning department is probably, and your planning staff are probably working with them. Um, these have been uh, really uh, highly recommended by the federal government through MAP 21. Um, and some of these have involved ITS and operations staff, but not frequently. So I think there's an open opportunity there to be able to collaborate with those folks. Often these uh, groups consist of major trucking companies and shipping, shippers in your, in your region. Um, the picture we have on the screen is of the Virginia Transportation, Freight Transportation Technical Advisory Committee, which serves as Virginia's uh, freight advisory group. And uh, among the people on that, on that group are some major trucking companies in the state who have a very intimate knowledge of the operations and provide a completely different perspective uh, to the state DOT and very, uh, very rich example of, uh, of collaborating. Um, another uh, very popular um, function of these types of uh, groups is meeting on a periodic basis. Uh, some have called the uh, Goods Movement Task Force at the Delaware Valley Regional Planning Commission in Philadelphia the gold standard. Uh, this group meets quarterly and they inform members of upcoming uh, topics of high interest. It's become the place for freight to meet in Philadelphia. Um, it brings together representatives from New Jersey DOT, Delaware DOT, and Pennsylvania DOT um, along with the private sector. Um, they network. Um, it doesn't hurt that they have some of the best food of any public meeting in the country, including often uh, Philly cheesesteaks. Um, but the main point here is that the, the folks who are involved in this formal process are able to shape planning and programming. They're actually able to help get freight projects into the queue, including freight operations projects. And they function as a very excellent sounding board and, and means for the planners and the operations folks to know exactly how their actions are affecting freight and economic competitiveness in the region. The other thing that's been happening um, with, with greater frequency and, and, and focused on freight is that a lot of the uh, corridor coalitions have been taking a special interest in freight. Uh, one of the pioneers of this was actually the I-95 Corridor Coalition, but others including the Mid-America Freight Coalition and the Northwest Passage have taken a greater interest in freight. Um, looking at collaborative operations solutions. So we're nearing the end and I, I want you to think more about uh, the following question. How can you facilitate goods movement within your agency? And here are several questions that I'd like you to consider as we close. Um, first, I think we need to um, take a close look at understanding operations and goods movement. Um, could you work with agency staff in the private sector to identify freight bottlenecks and implement uh, strategies to alleviate those? Uh, can you identify and mitigate truck crash hotspots? Uh, can you um, improve freight specific communications, including the types of things that Washington State is doing? Can you improve truck parking information and availability? Uh, can you get to know the emerging technologies and applications, including the autonomous trucks and uh, the V2V uh, truck aspects. Can you outreach with freight stakeholders to identify operations, needs, and work on improvements? Um, if you're able to do these things, I think we will have a better idea of knowing what truckers and shippers think about operations and being able to work with them to improve their supply chains, especially the parts of their supply chains that we control. And ultimately developing freight operations implementations plans jointly with planning staff. Here's a, a quick snippet from uh, the Idaho freight plan, which very specifically included steps that would improve freight operations. So with that, I thank you for your attention and time, and I think we can take questions now.